Contemplating what is consciousness is a concept that has puzzled philosophers, scientists, and even regular people for centuries. I think, therefore I am. Consciousness in the modern form has been reduced and limited as a result of scientific models and hegemony within the scientific community. It has become a victim of reductionism and serves in the scientific and psychological fields as nothing more than the state of being aware of one's surroundings, thoughts, and sensations. Being the thing that allows us to experience the world around us and have subjective experiences. As usual, all wonder and curiosity is thrown out the window with psychologists and neuroscientists trying to dwindle consciousness down into a neat little box of functionalism. But the question still remains, what is it? Is there a shared consciousness? Is consciousness reliant on a brain? Is it just an evolutionary trigger or adaptation? Does all living things have a consciousness? As usual, these reductionists leave out one thing regarding consciousness. And with that, let's explore. Let's look at what is commonly thought of as consciousness. We have awareness, meaning being aware of one's surroundings, thoughts, and sensations. If we reduce consciousness to these basic foundations, we can easily make a case that all living animals, at the very least mammals, are conscious beings. They all are aware of their surroundings, are aware of their sensations, and in many animals seem to be aware of their thoughts, though this latter one is difficult to test with the language barrier between animals and us. They simply cannot tell us they are aware of their thoughts, so we have to interpret this through tests and observations. However, if you ever had a pet who plays upon its cuteness and tries to manipulate you to get what that pet desires, you can deduce that there must be some form of awareness of thought there. With this reduced definition, we could safely state that yes, mammals and at least some other animals seem to have consciousness. But this isn't really what we mean with consciousness, at least in the concept of defining what it really is. This seems to those who ponder such questions, at best, a baseline of what consciousness is alluding immediately to levels of consciousness, which opens a whole new avenue of the discussion. One thing left out of this reductionist definition is memory. If you are aware of your environment, thoughts, and sensations, and do not remember things outside of the unconscious memory of learned or genetic instincts, then you could argue that these animals do not have consciousness, as there would be no subjective experience without short-term or long-term memory, even on a scale. And the subjective experience is a key component to how even the reductionists define consciousness. And we see memory even in our pets. Even if it's a learned behavior such as manipulation, the thought to do it in the first place happened, and thus a memory of this has wired itself into its brain. And it's not a learned trait in their evolution or genetics. Some animals have shorter memories, some have longer memories. Elephants, for example, have such long-term memories and display an emotional connection to these memories, showing that indeed there is a complexity to them that we as humans can identify with. They will return to the spot of a fallen family member or friend years and years later and pay a type of respect to the fallen elephant. So what memory shows us is there can be in other animals, just like humans, an awareness of events in the past as well as the present. Memory gives us a key to our self-awareness. It gives us a marker, an experience to experience relation to the world that is outside the immediate here and now of one's experiences. Memory is a fundamental key to how we define ourselves in our present as we go through our lives. It is almost like a navigational compass keeping us sailing on course. But memory is not enough to add on to suggest these combinations give us what we commonly think of as consciousness. There is a man who had lost all his long-term memory from the age of 16 onwards. His name is Henry Mollison. He suffered from epileptic seizures for many years of his life. He ended up in an operating room in which a neurosurgeon sucked out the hippocampus part of his brain. With it, all his long-term memory. But that wasn't all. He was unable to also form new conscious memories. He was left with a memory from 16 years old and prior. The 11 years up to his surgery and after, he couldn't remember or form new memories. So he was still left with memories of a version of himself, an ability to hang on to that form of reference and relationship to himself in the world around him. 
However, the present person would be in a perpetual Groundhog Day. His memory was so bad, he would turn around from talking to someone, and then seeing them again wouldn't remember that person was even there to begin with. It's a truly fascinating story. Now, interesting enough, he was able to retain memory of motor skills. He became better at drawing a path through a picture of a maze, or learning to use a walking frame when he sprained his ankle. This shows the difference between conscious and the unconscious, or you could say, adaptive motor functions or genetic passed on abilities. This contrast is there to help us define what exactly consciousness is. What else is interesting is that he had a wonderful personality and was always very happy. However, without a memory, we can show this to be a possible key in awareness. Was Henry fully conscious after the surgery? He had feelings. He was able to learn motor functions and abilities, was able to talk and engage with people. It is an interesting study because we can say that consciousness in this case could be one of two things. He was able to still have a consciousness because he still had some memories from his youth. Or one could say memory isn't needed after all for consciousness. But it is a helpful tool for consciousness to become more elevated. We could incorporate having a personality as evidence of consciousness. Henry still had a personality. But is this personality consciousness or is it an imprint of a consciousness on the brain of an individual due to memories? When we think about consciousness, we are often thought to conceive this as a function of the brain, not only primarily, but in many cases, it is all reduced to the brain. Neurologists and neuroscientists scan the brain and do tests on it. What they inevitably find is nothing more than parts of cognition. Dr. Anil Seth, who had done incredible research on consciousness focusing on the brain and neuroscience of the brain in regards to consciousness. I won't say anything bad about his research, but his lecture that I watched, he did nothing but explain cognition. And when doing it, the one criticism I do have is that he did so smugly and arrogantly under the pretext of its, his findings being of cognition equaling consciousness. Mark Solms is a psychoanalyst and neuropsychologist. He gave a good example in the study case of his brother, who when they were children, the brother fell three stories and had a massive brain injury. His brother survived the fall, but when he came back home, he was different. And then there's a conclusion here by Solms that the brain was damaged and his brother was not there anymore. Again, that brain is therefore the source of consciousness. The idea of personality as consciousness again persists. We seem to be at a deviation. Is ego or the id, or in layman's terms, the personality part of consciousness? Or is it that of an imprint on a consciousness tied to a being of complexity that has a memory, motor skills, brain activity, sensations, etc., i.e. is consciousness separate from our brain? Scientists and many philosophers can't seem to, or don't want to, entertain the thought that these may be two separate things. If we break the antenna off a radio, do we say it is no longer a radio? No, it's a broken radio. It is just unable to receive the radio signals. We should look at consciousness in the same way. The brain is the transmitter and receiver, but it's also the computational center where we can organize our thoughts label and interpret things coming in and choose what is going out. The brain is only a part of this process. It is not consciousness itself, but its evolved biological function is necessary for the expression of consciousness in this reality we find ourselves in. Scientists often break down the brain functions that we get from the senses, and this brings them down a road of fallacy. For this line of thinking insists that deaf and blind people cannot be conscious, or would have a lesser consciousness. And this simply isn't true. If experiencing sensations and visual stimuli give us consciousness, is a blind person less conscious than the one who is not blind? One has to think of consciousness like entanglement. Consciousness becomes entangled with the person experiencing the world. In any way that individual experiences it. Deaf, blind, every possible variation of experiences. In the case of the brother, you could say his brother became decohered from some aspects of his consciousness, or more accurately, decohered from his experiences prior to the accident. Or because he had new traumatic experiences, it altered his perception. His consciousness remains but is now expressing itself differently both internal and external due to the trauma. Thus, he was not himself. This 
is what I think remains the elusive part of consciousness to the reductionists. The spiritual and religious are a bit better at this, but not all equally. Some become quite rigid and reductionist too, as the desire for control takes over. And that is that an individual creature that has consciousness is merely an expression of aspects of consciousness, ones we can all share in, and thus the relation we feel to one another, and the ones that seem foreign to us, and thus we are either curious about or repulsed by. Our preferences, our attractions and repulsions can illustrate an aspect of consciousness as we are gifted with the concept of free will. And free will does not lay on only us humans. All animals can make choices, just as us humans do. However, while we like to think us humans are not socially restricted or influenced by others and the environment, we, much like our animal brethren, are. I think therefore I am, both talks to those that think being real, but also a concept that thinking constitutes consciousness. And we must think, can we remove the brain and still have consciousness? Dr. Solms above has done a lot of research on people who have either lost massive parts of the brain, once thought to be the source of consciousness, and found that the patients all maintain memories and personality and self-awareness. Even those born with only a brain stem show forms of identity and personality and signs of consciousness. And he says this is a manifest by their emotion. He claims emotion is the key to consciousness. Emotion is an interesting thing, for we see animals showing emotions as well, like the elephants returning to the grave of a family member. We see even contextualized emotion and thought combined in animals as well as humans. So is emotion consciousness? We have to rule it out as being the entirety of consciousness because emotion is a completely reactionary system. We don't know what emotion we would have if we were baseline. We exist in a meat bag that has millions of interactions over our life, in printed memories, experiences that shape how we navigate and perceive the world, and these are imprinted on us mainly due to our emotions, which are reactions to events. Emotions are also an evolutionary trait passed down, and is key to our survival. So to say emotions equal consciousness isn't accurate. However, emotion is the key to understanding consciousness. It is the thing that gives us the concept of free will or choice. We can make choices that lead to different emotional outcomes based on learned experience. And this duality is why free will is so often debated. Is it merely learned behavior and you're not choosing? You're acting on instinct. Or are you actually choosing? I would say we see this choice even in animals. And while they may have a more limited capacity for computational power, the choices they make are in scale with ours. So up to now, I would say that we have laid the foundation of the baseline of consciousness or the baseline of lower to mid-range consciousness. On this level, we are merely more complex versions of animals. But we have something else that I think explains what true consciousness is. Though we could say higher consciousness over lower consciousness, but we can discuss that later on. This thing we have that animals do not seem to have is called abstraction. Humans' ability to think abstractly, live in abstraction, create things from abstraction, relate to things abstractly makes us vastly different from animals. We have the ability to imagine, alter the world from this imagination. In a very real sense, we create out of nothing but our ability to think abstractly and imagine. Things that were not there before. No other animal has this ability. We can create art, stories, constructions, tools, spaceships, mathematics, artificial life, alter existing life. We can, like gods, alter our environment and no other animal has this ability. And this ability is the big key to consciousness. When we think of consciousness, yes, we think of self-awareness, etc. But what we really mean is this extra bit, this emotion, this imagination, we can create whole situations, lives, etc. in our own minds, feel the emotions of those things that didn't actually happen, and even alter our decisions based on those imaginings. Imagination and abstract thinking is the mystery, the magic that makes us wonder what consciousness is. It moves us from sentient beings to conscious beings. And what I believe the reductionists are really doing when tackling consciousness is that they are defining and describing sentience. So far we have attempted to define what consciousness is to us, each one of us. 
but there is a much larger conversation to what this ability to think abstractly, combined with all other sentient traits, are that is left for us to talk about. Like, where does this come from? Is this merely an evolved trait tacked onto our brains and system merely due to the complexity of humans and perhaps done by some random mutation? Or is it something more? In part two of this series, we'll explore those aspects of consciousness. Till then, let me know what you think. Leave a comment below and please like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell and share this video. It really helps out a small channel like this. Till next time, be safe and thank you for watching.